Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here today about marijuana use in pregnancy and while breastfeeding. I have no conflicts of interest that are related to the content of this presentation. Our learning objectives today are to define the prevalence of marijuana use in pregnancy and the reported reasons for use, um, to tell you how to counsel women regarding the risks of marijuana use during pregnancy and lactation based on the current evidence, and to help with um, recommending and utilizing available online resources when counseling women regarding marijuana use in pregnancy and lactation. So just a little bit of background, marijuana is the most common illicit drug use in pregnancy. Um, we know that it crosses the placenta and there's anticipated increased use with increasing legalization of recreational marijuana, which we've certainly seen and I'm going to show you some data to support that. This is just a map of the United States showing you all the states in green where there's at least some level of uh, legalization. The ones in bright green have both uh, medical and recreational use legalized, whereas the darker green are just medical use at this time. But overall, the majority of people in the United States have access to uh, legalized marijuana. So what is marijuana? Marijuana is the cannabis sativa or indica plant. It contains over 600 chemicals, THC is what's the psychoactive component. And then cannabidiol, as you've probably heard about, have potentially a sedative and maybe a therapeutic effect, although that's up for debate. There are definitely mixed data on that. And there's different modes of consumption. So there's smoking, vaping, eating, and then some people even use topical or lotion-based uh, cannabidiols. So why does it matter? Um, and why does it matter how it's consumed? Importantly, smoking has a much faster onset, so five to 15 minutes, and that effect usually lasts one to three hours, whereas edibles have a much slower onset, 30 minutes to an hour, and then the peak effect can occur anywhere from one to six hours. So you can imagine that um, that's problematic, and we did see increased emergency department visits and toxicity from edible products with high concentrations of THC when they were initially um, released. And I was actually in Colorado at the time when marijuana became legalized there, and it was one of the first two states to legalize recreational marijuana. And so that's how I actually initially became interested in this. And what we saw was people going to the dispensaries, getting a cookie, you know, and they would say, eat you know, a quarter or eat a sixth of this cookie and people would do that. And then, you know, 10 minutes later, they wouldn't feel anything. And they would say, oh, I must just be really tolerant and I should have more. And then basically over time that stacked up. And by the time people were seeing peak effects, then they were um, in a toxic range. So what about the prevalence of marijuana use in pregnancy specifically? If you look in the literature, it ranges anywhere from three to 30%. Uh, Data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, which is a cross-sectional nationally representative survey, shows that about 2.4% of pregnant patients in 2002 reported past month use. So 2.4% past month use in, 20, in 2002. That increased to 3.9% in 2014 and 4.9% in 2016. Um, so we are seeing an increase in use over time that also coincides with increasing legalization across the United States. We did a study um, in Colorado in 2018 where we looked at paired samples. So we approached 116 pregnant people and we asked them to fill a out a survey about their marijuana use over the past month. We also looked in their charts to see if they'd reported use to a healthcare provider and we also took a segment of their umbilical cord to see if it tested positive for marijuana. And what we found was that 2.6% of uh, the patients that we spoke with and enrolled had reported use to a healthcare provider. 6% reported use in the last 30 days on an anonymous survey. So they basically filled it out, put it in an envelope and gave it to us. And 10% had a THCA, which is one of the metabolites of THC above the limit of quantification in the umbilical cord. So, that's the limit that would be used in clinical practice. So if you sent an umbilical cord to be tested for marijuana, 10% would have been positive. And then the limit of detection, 22% would, would have been positive. And that's more of a research limit. It's much more sensitive. Um, you know, the lab assures me that it is there. If they can find it there, they just don't use quite a low threshold in clinical practice because they want to be absolutely certain if they're going to report out a positive result. So somewhere between 10 and 22% of patients um, who delivered at uh, urban Colorado practices in 2018 after legalization had used marijuana in the last month. 
So what other data do we have about increased use with legalization? So there are data from the US Drug Testing Laboratories and they looked at Colorado meconium lab results and compared them to other states without legalization over the same time period. So they looked at the first nine months of 2012 and the first nine months of 2014 and marijuana was legalized in January of 2014 in Colorado. And what they found was an increase by 10% in THC positive samples in Colorado. That was consistent with the rest of the country. But the concentration of THC in Colorado samples also increased. So the mean um, was 213 nanograms per gram pre-legalization and 361 nanograms per gram post-legalization. And the thought was this potentially reflected that uh, patients were using higher potency products that were available in dispensaries. So what are the reasons for use? This is something that people always ask me when I speak about marijuana use in pregnancy. Um, they always want to know, well, why, why do pregnant women use marijuana? And there are not a lot of data on this. Um, there's a lot of anecdotal data. Um, there's some data looking at uh, mental health conditions and uh, co-use, but that's a little bit tricky uh, as to whether the mental health condition preceded or was after the marijuana use. But this is actually a study where they talked to patients. They, it was a convenient sample, about 1,700 women who are participating in WIC. And what's interesting, I think, uh, for healthcare practitioners to know is that patients who continue to use marijuana in pregnancy do perceive benefits of, of use. And so if you look at this column of people are currently using, you can see that 63% of them say it helps with their depression, anxiety, or stress. 60% says it helps with pain. 50% says nausea and vomiting. And then for fun and recreation is only 39% and other reason 14%. If you compare that to people have used in the past or past users in this, um, in this column here, what you can see is that the majority of people have used in the past who aren't currently using said 65% of the time is for fun or recreation. So I think that it's notable that the patients who continue to use marijuana during pregnancy are really perceiving a benefit and that we may be able to offer them safe alternatives if we understand what that perceived benefit is. So what about nausea and vomiting of pregnancy? This comes a lot a lot that people say that they use marijuana for treatment of nausea and vomiting in pregnancy. This is a retrospective cohort study that came out of Kaiser Permanente Northern California data. And I'm gonna reference this data set a lot. They've published a number of papers out of it. Um, and they, what they did is they do universal screening with the urine toxicology screen and questionnaire early in pregnancy throughout the Kaiser system. <clears throat> And then what they did was take that universal screening data and look at an ICD diagnosis for nausea and vomiting of pregnancy. And they found uh, cases of severe nausea documented in 2.4% and mild nausea in 15%. And what they found is that individuals with severe nausea and vomiting of pregnancy had a higher odds of also using marijuana. And same thing with mild nausea and vomiting of pregnancy. So this is just an association saying that if people noted that they had more severe nausea, that they had increased odds of marijuana use. Now, we don't know if it's because the marijuana use made it worse or they're treating with marijuana. Um, I think there are also some issues with using ICD-10 diagnosis for this. We know that this is under capturing somewhat um, because there are uh, much higher rates of nausea and vomiting in pregnancy typically uh, than 15%. So what about safety? Um, there is an increasing perception of safety of marijuana use in pregnancy. This is a research letter that was published in the American Journal of OBGYN in 2017. They also used the NISDA data or the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. And interestingly, when you look at, they were comparing 2005 to 2015 and looking at perceived safety. And among people who were not using, so no past 30 day use who were pregnant, Surprisingly, still 16.5% of them said, I don't think there would be any risk of harm with using marijuana in pregnancy. When you go out here to these past 30 day use and their pregnancy, meaning people are actively using in pregnancy, 65% of them said, yeah, I don't think there's any risk of harm um, to use marijuana during pregnancy. And so I think it just demonstrates increasing perception of safety and some opportunity for us to speak with patients about potential risks. Before we get into that, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about methods of testing for use. Typically in OB practice, we're using urine um, and that's because there's lots of it around in your in pregnancy. Um, it's an easy biological specimen to collect. Patients are coming in and giving urine samples anyway, for the most part for standard obstetric testing for things like proteinuria. 
Um, so you can use urine. Urine is positive for about two to three days in the occasional and a uh, person uses it occasionally and weeks in somebody who uses more chronically. Um, meconium can also be used. It's um, used from the second trimester onward uh, is typically what we think it detects. Hair can be used and it certainly can be used once it's stripped and uh, used appropriately, but often people don't want hair removed and there are some issues with passive exposure and you have to be careful about how you process that. So it's just not very practical. And serum can be used, but it's similar um, in terms of urine and picking up use in the past two to three days and an occasional user. So urine is typically easier and less invasive. There's also umbilical cord homogenate and a lot of practices have transitioned to this um, in clinical practice. And many of you may have seen this transition in pediatric practice. So basically, you know, at every delivery, we're collecting a segment of umbilical cord typically anyway. We collect that to do umbilical cord gas assessment. But after that, you know, the cord is drained of blood and it's discarded, but that drained cord can be used for uh, drug testing. And I think a lot of places have moved to this. Um, it utilizes an otherwise discarded specimen. It's thought to identify use from the second trimester onward, just as meconium does. It's much easier to collect than meconium, but meconium is probably a little bit more sensitive. There are some data uh, suggesting that. And so if you really want to find every single person who is using drugs or marijuana, then meconium is going to be a sen more sensitive assay, but umbilical cord homogenate is a pretty good measurement as well. And it's certainly much easier. So now we're going to talk a lot about the data about marijuana use and pregnancy. But first, I have to tell you that there are some major caveats to these data, and there are really problems with the existing studies that are out there. Most frequently, we really have a lack of quantification and timing of exposure, which is really problematic when you're thinking about obstetric studies. There's a lot of difficulty adjusting for tobacco, other drugs, and sociodemographic factors that may play a role as well. And there's a really high reliance on self-report, which is a problem in the literature. Um, there was a study that came out in 1995 where they did a prospective cohort study and they did structured interviews and maternal serum toxicology screens. And 70% of the women who had a positive THC on serum toxicology screen denied use in the structured interview. And you'll remember that those are only positive for two to three days in somebody who's using uh, drugs occasionally. And so that means that 70% of the people who used in the past couple of days said, no, I'm not using in a study where they were doing structured interviews specifically to detect drug use and patients knew that that's what they were doing. So it just shows you that self-report is not a good measure of drug use in pregnancy. And that's probably because of the social desirability of saying that you do not use drugs in pregnancy. There's been other work done in this area. Um, this is that same Kaiser Permanente group. Uh, Kelly Young Wolf uh, is the first author on many of their publications. Uh, this is again, a retrospective cohort from 2009 to 17. They had 281,000 uh, patients in this particular study. Their urine toxicology was positive about 5% of the time, but self-report was only positive about 2.5% of the time. So this is pretty similar to the data that we found as well in terms of looking at the medical record versus actually having somebody tested or um, reporting it in a survey. And they found that being older of Hispanic ethnicity and lower household income were all associated with misclassification of not using cannabis by self-report, meaning those patient groups were less likely to self-report use. We did a project where we have um, what's called the Children's Adolescent Maternity Program or CAMP, um, where it was a retrospective cohort of adolescents who were pregnant, who had universal biologic sampling for drugs early in pregnancy. That was just part of their standard routine, prenatal care. So we had it on everybody. It wasn't biased by, um, you know, just having it on patients in which it was ordered by the clinician in a haphazard way. And we evaluated if marijuana use was associated with a composite adverse pregnancy outcome. So stillbirth, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, spontaneous preterm birth, or small for gestational age. And as I mentioned, marijuana exposure was ascertained by urine toxicology. So whether that was positive for marijuana or if these patients self-reported use on a uniformly administered questionnaire. And we found that overall 1,206 um, patients were marijuana exposed during pregnancy. 
And so there were 204 total, uh, I'm sorry, there were 1,206 total with 204 marijuana exposed births. But interestingly, if you take those 204 marijuana exposed births here, what you see is that urine toxicology picked up 133 of them by itself. 60 of them overlapped on self-report and urine tox. And there were 11 that self-reported but didn't have a urine tox that was positive. So over half were only picked up because they had a urine toxicology screen and would not have been identified um, by self-report alone. So why does that matter? Well, when we model that and look at uh, marijuana use, either by UTOX or self-report, it was associated with our adverse outcomes. So all of those adverse pregnancy outcomes that I mentioned previously. When we modeled it using self-report alone, so pretending like we didn't have the urine tox and we just did it with self-report, marijuana use was not associated with the, with the primary outcome. In fact, it was almost completely negative. Odds ratio of 1.06 and one would be nothing, no, no, no association. And there's pre preliminary evidence of a dose response. So among patients who had more than one UTOX that was positive, the adjusted odds ratio 3.75, now it starts to get your attention. So what we found is that when we relied on self-report alone, basically we would have found no association between marijuana, versus and marijuana use and adverse outcomes, which is problematic because I'm gonna show you the data that most data rely on. Most projects rely on that self-reported data alone. Now, when we looked with UTOX also, we did see an association when people had multiple eutoxes that are positive across pregnancy, we definitely saw a strong association, association suggesting that perhaps there is um, an issue with timing and duration of exposure as well. So this is the other big issue with marijuana studies that are out there. A lot of them were done in the 80s and 90s. This is the other stuff that was happening in the 80s and 90s. And a lot of you may not remember all, any of this. You may be too young too, but you can see that you know we had MTV and we had Jane Fonda doing, you know, exercise in hot pink leotards and people in, in movies with cigarettes hanging in their mouths and things you just don't see anymore. Um, and that's the same thing with marijuana products. Marijuana products in the 80s and 90s, when the majority of these initial studies were done, were not very potent. Um, they had a much lower, like 3% potency, whereas now in dispensaries, we see products that have 30 to 40% potency. So even with the data that we have um, and the flaws that I've already noted, it may just not be applicable to the products that uh, patients are using today. By far the most studied outcome in research related to marijuana and pregnancy is fetal growth restriction. Um, there are tons of articles on this uh, and the data are really mixed. Uh, the first meta-analysis that came out on this came out in 1997 after the initial onslaught of pregnancy and marijuana studies that came out in the 80s and 90s. And that meta-analysis focused on the association between marijuana exposure and birth weight. And women who consumed mar marijuana more than four times per week had babies that weighed less than non-users by about 130 grams on average. But the pooled odds ratio for low birth weight with any marijuana use was only was 1.09, meaning basically non-significant. So the question is, what do we take away from this? Is it clinically significant that these patients who use more than four times per week had babies about 131 grams on average less? Um, one could argue yes, one could argue no, but I think that there's been subsequent data that is reasonably convincing that there is a link between marijuana use and adverse fetal growth. This is a study out of uh, the Generation R study, which is from the Netherlands, where their prospect, it's a prospective observational study. And in this study, they assessed fetal growth by ultrasound. And fetuses who were exposed to cannabis in early pregnancy grew about 11 grams per week less than non-users. And fetuses exposed to cannabis throughout the pregnancy grew about 14 grams per week less than those who were unexposed. And so we do see some decrement in growth. And we see that, that again, it's potentially related to timing and duration of exposure. And this study is worth mentioning because it's one of the few that actually use ultrasound to measure growth rather than just using birth weight. This is a more recent retrospective cohort study that was published in 2019. They compared patients who reported daily marijuana use with unexposed pregnancies matched by gestational age, and they found no differences in the first trimester or at the anatomic survey, which isn't really surprising. We don't really see growth, growth differential emerge until later in pregnancy. But what they saw is that in the third trimester, they saw a higher prevalence of fetal growth restriction in the marijuana exposed fetuses, 14% versus 3%, and that was statistically significant. 
This is a large uh, study that we just did a secondary analysis on. So you all may be familiar with the new mom to be network or um, Melipris mothers to be network. It's basically a large multi-center observational trial where they enrolled about 10,000 Melipris patients early in pregnancy, collected biologic samples and a whole bunch of outcome data on them over time. For this particular secondary analysis, we used 9,163 of the enrolled participants. Marijuana use is only self-reported in 1.5%. Now this is probably on the low side in part because these are patients that were willing to enroll in longitudinal um, research studies and so may um, be less likely to chronically use marijuana. Um, and in part because we know that self-report under reports. Um, but what we saw is differences in growth um, among the fetuses of those exposed to unexposed that started around 28 weeks. So in this figure over here, the green is marijuana use, the black is no marijuana use. And what you can see both with population-based growth standards as well as customized growth standards was that right around 28 weeks, the difference between the two started to become significant. Um, and the SGA was certainly higher in the uh, group that used marijuana, 22% versus 9% using population-based standards and 25% versus 14% using customized standards. So we definitely saw a decrement in growth over time and we saw it emerge around 28 weeks gestation. So this is a really busy slide that I don't expect you to read. Um, and these, are, it is a little bit old now. Um, we published in 2015, really a comprehensive review of marijuana use in pregnancy and looked at these various outcomes. So this happens to be one of the charts for fetal growth restriction. And the things I want you to take away from this and um, on the slide today are just that the data are so mixed. So if you look over here, the ones that are highlighted in green say, yep, there is an association between marijuana use and fetal growth restriction. The ones that are not highlighted in green say, nope, there wasn't any association. And the ones with the red circle say that there was actually biologic sampling and it wasn't just self-report. So the important thing for you to take away is that there are mixed data out there about all of these outcomes. The very few of the studies actually have any biologic sampling. And then if you really want to delve into the details of the data that are out there, then um, this publication that we wrote in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology in 2015 is a nice resource for that. There have been subsequent studies, um, but I'm summarizing most of those today and the older studies you can find here. So what about preterm birth? Um, the data also are really mixed for this. There are a couple of large cohorts that are worth mentioning. There's an Australian cohort that has 25,000 patients who self-reported marijuana use at uh, prenatal care intake. And marijuana use was associated with preterm birth with an odds ratio of 1.5. There's another study also out of Australia where they looked at ICD-10 codes for substance use, which we know under capture use. And they saw an increased incidence of preterm birth among those who used marijuana, 19% versus 6%. And then the ALSPAC database, which is a UK database of 12,000, found the preterm birth rate was exactly the same among those who use versus not use uh, marijuana, 4.6% of both groups. So it's just really hard. Even in these large database studies, you're seeing mixed results, and it's hard to know what to take away from it. And I think it's really a problem of how we're ascertaining it, how we're looking at the outcomes, and then, of course, relying mostly on self-report. There are a couple of more recent preterm birth studies. Oh, actually, this is not one of them. Sorry, I will mention this. This is the 1995 study going back. That is not more recent, uh, but worth mentioning. I mentioned at the beginning, but the flip side of that, uh, the statistic that I previously gave you about 70%, is that only 31% of the women who had a positive serum screen self-reported marijuana use in a structured interview. So again, like they're not willing to tell you this in pregnancy. Conversely, about 43% of the women who self-reported use had a positive serum screen. So this also speaks to the problem with the current tests, the biologic sampling tests that we have, right? The patients who said, yes, I have used recently, a lot of them didn't test positive. And that's because in an occasional user, it's only be positive for a couple of days. And there was no association with preterm birth with self-report and our serum screen positive when they did this study. But when they looked specifically at serum positive for THC, they found an association with preterm birth. And so what these authors said was, well, maybe that's because those are patients that are using more regularly or more frequently, they had a positive serum screen, and that's when we start to see an association with these adverse outcomes. 
These are the more recent data that I alluded to previously. These are a couple of studies looking at spontaneous preterm births specifically. And as you as neonatologists know, there are differences between those babies who are born from spontaneous preterm birth rather than a medically indicated preterm birth. So focusing very specifically on spontaneous preterm birth, this first study by Sorrell and colleagues out of France um, had only 1% prevalence of use. So that's concerning to me for under capture of use. Um, either that or people in France just don't use marijuana, but I think probably we just got under capture of use in this uh, particular sample. But any marijuana use that was reported was associated with spontaneous preterm birth with an odds ratio of 2.15. So getting in these odds ratios above two certainly makes us worried. Um, Decker and colleagues were doing a study specifically focused on spontaneous preterm birth, and this was done um, in the US, and they had 7% of marijuana exposed by self-report and structured interviews. And that's about where I think it should probably be in the US as well. When we sort of look at population prevalence, it probably is somewhere in the 7% range. Um, and here they found pre-pregnancy use was associated with spontaneous preterm birth with intact membranes, meaning not preterm -pre premature rupture membranes, but people just going into spontaneous preterm labor. And the odds ratio is 2.3. So again, an odds ratio up above two, which makes you wonder if we really need to be sorting out very specifically whether it's in association with spontaneous preterm birth or iatrogenic or medically indicated preterm birth. And that really hasn't been sorted out very well in the existing literature. These are data that came out in JAMA in 2019, also looking at preterm birth. This was a large retrospective Canadian cohort looking at 661,000 patients. They had a prevalence of self-reported use of 1.4%, again, on the lower end of what we'd expect, probably under ascertainment. And the rate of preterm birth among women with use was 12% versus 6% in those who do not use. So the per, there was a, and there was a persistent association between marijuana use and preterm birth under 37 weeks in this cohort with a relative risk of 1.4. Um, the high, there was even higher risk with early preterm birth between 32 and 37 weeks. So, um, but they said, you know, interpret these findings with caution. It's hard to adjust for everything. Um, what about stillbirth? Stillbirth is hard because data are really limited related to stillbirth. Um, this is something that patients certainly care about. I think that the issue really is that in many obstetric studies, we exclude people who have stillbirths. That's, um, you know, the first sentence of the methods, right, of every obstetric study is we excluded stillbirths or we focused on live births. And so we have very little data related to stillbirths specifically. There is, however, this case control study that was conducted by the NICHD Stillbirth Collaborative Research Network. And they found an association between stillbirth and marijuana use that was demonstrated by a cord homogenate being positive for THC. So using that umbilical cord homogenate sampling method, um, they found uh, patients who had uh, positive uh, cord samples for marijuana use, and they did find that it was associated with stillbirth. And after they adjusted for cotinine, which is a way to adjust for the amount of tobacco use, um, they found that that did reduce the stillbirth odds ratio a little bit for marijuana by about 10%, but the marijuana was still associated with, uh, marijuana use was still associated with stillbirth, which is certainly concerning. What about congenital anomalies? This is another uh, area of a lot of interest from patients especially. Uh, and this one's hard. The data are really limited and they're mixed. Um, in 1983, Lynn and colleagues found no association with major malformation with an odds ratio of 1.36, so it crosses one. And there's also large retrospective cohort studies that are based on birth defects registries. And the problem with these is there's incomplete ascertainment of confounding, right? So, and there's potential for recall bias. So it's hard to go back and see all the other things that happen in their pregnancy. Usually these patients are contacted like six months to two years after the birth. And so of course, when you ask somebody whose baby has a heart defect, um, you know, two years after, and they've been through multiple surgeries and you're calling them and you're saying, we just want to find out about exposures and pregnancy. And that patient has like racked their brain about every possible thing they could have done that could have resulted in this heart defect. And so you say, did you use marijuana? And they say, yes, because they're thinking of that one time that they walked through a parking lot and they walked by a big party with a bunch of people smoking pot and they smelled it and they were marijuana exposed. And then you ask the patient whose baby's totally fine. 
um, did you use marijuana during pregnancy? And they're like, no, I didn't use it at all. But they forgot about the fact that they used it every day throughout the whole first trimester before they found out that they were pregnant, but after embryogenesis had already occurred. And so those are the problems of these birth defects registry studies. It doesn't mean that they're not useful. Of course they are. They've brought a lot of important information to the field, but we have to remember there's a lot of potential for recall bias in those studies. This is one study that was very well done and adjusted for a lot of other confounders. And so I think worth mentioning, this is an Atlanta birth defects registry study. They found 122 cases of VSD and 3,029 controls. They adjusted for all the things we'd want them to. And a lot of studies don't adjust for. So things like maternal age, overt diabetes, vitamin use, um, and periconceptual marijuana was associated with VSD with an odds ratio of 1.9. But they said more data are needed. This is an adequate evidence of an association with a specific congenital birth defect. And there hasn't been a validation of this to this point, um, but certainly it, it, it warrants further work. NICU admission is another uh, area of a lot of interest right now. It's a little bit tricky as an outcome in and of itself, as you as neonatal providers know. Um, the threshold for NICU admission is highly variable by institution and variable by what other resources they have. So whether there's like an intermediate care nursery or whether there's not. And so NICU is a little bit of a tricky outcome, um, but it certainly has been looked at and has been looked at with um, increasing interest. And so this is a study in 2015, a retrospective cohort study of about 6,500 women, 6,100 who weren't using marijuana, 361 who were. And they saw an increased risk of NICU admission, 12.5% versus 17.2% among those babies that were exposed to marijuana in pregnancy. We did a secondary analysis of some of the stillbirth network data, but we just looked at the live births that they'd used as controls. And we found marijuana use in about 2.7% of the live births of this particular study. And initially, we just looked at a primary composite of adverse pregnancy outcomes. That was our focus, looking at hypertension, stillbirth, SGA, and spontaneous preterm birth. And that was similar among those who used and didn't use, although it was 31% versus 21%. So, I mean, there was a 10% difference, but we didn't have a big cohort. And so we were underpowered to detect smaller differences. And we came up with an adjusted odds ratio of 1.3 and a confidence interval that crossed one. But when we looked secondarily at neonatal morbidity, we did see an association between marijuana use and neonatal morbidity. We saw very similar numbers to that Warshak trial. So about 17% admission to the NICU with any marijuana use versus 9% without. And we also looked at a composite neonatal morbidity or death. And it's this big long list here. And you as neonatologists may say, why are all those things in that list? And the answer is that they were all the secondary outcomes that were in the primary trial. And we just used the same ones in the secondary analysis. But we did find a high rate of composite neonatal morbidity or death of 14% among those who used marijuana versus only 4% in those who didn't. And that was statistically significant. And when we modeled it and adjusted for uh, covariates that we thought were important to adjust for, including tobacco use, we found that the composite morbidity was still much higher among those who are marijuana exposed. So an adjusted odds ratio of 3.1. And so that's a big one and makes us wonder, um, and it certainly keeps on the radar, the idea of neonatal morbidity and the need to investigate that further. So I've given you a bunch of data and when we have all these random studies and all this mixed data, what do we do to try to translate it into something we can use in clinical practice? There's been a couple of systematic reviews and meta-analyses that have come out that I think are helpful in that regard. And the National Academy of Sciences has also put out a health effects of cannabis um, review, which I think is helpful also. So I'm gonna go through those a little bit. So this is the first meta-analysis that came out from Gunn and colleagues. They conducted a systematic review and then they did a meta-analysis anytime there were three or more studies available with the same outcome. And they identified primary outcomes as maternal, fetal, or neonatal up to six weeks postpartum after cannabis exposure. Ultimately, here's a list of all the things that had three or more studies. I'll let you read through those. But what they found was that there was an increased odds of anemia, low birth weight, and so it's maternal anemia, sorry, maternal anemia, not neonatal, low birth weight and NICU admission. And they said, gosh, there's a lot of studies out there, but more studies are needed because not a lot of them are high quality and we couldn't even put them in this meta-analysis. 
So that came out in 2016. Shortly thereafter, there was another meta-analysis that was published by Connor, Shana Connor and colleagues. And their aim was a little bit more specific. They wanted to estimate if marijuana use increases the risk of adverse neonatal outcomes, specifically looking at low birth weight less than 2,500 grams or preterm birth less than 37 weeks. And they had a bunch of secondary outcomes that are listed there. And overall, they found 31 studies total, 12 with low birth weight and 14 preterm birth. And pooled unadjusted data demonstrated an association between marijuana use and low birth weight and preterm birth. And the raw numbers are there. But after they adjusted for tobacco and other confounders, they said there was no longer an association. The low birth weight pooled relative risk was 1.1, and the preterm birth pooled relative risk was 1.08. And these weren't significant. And they basically said that, you know, they didn't think that there was an association between marijuana and these adverse outcomes. But then when they did a planned sub-analysis looking at moderate to heavy use defined as at least once per week, marijuana use was associated with low birth weight with a relative risk of 1.9, and it was associated with preterm birth with a relative risk of 2.0. So these are the data that ACOG has put into their committee opinion about uh, marijuana use and pregnancy saying that, yeah, it does look like potentially there is an association with these adverse outcomes and we should be counseling patients that they shouldn't use marijuana during pregnancy. And we sort of take all those data together. This is a review article that we put together in 2018. It's in the Green Journal, which is obstetrics and gynecology, if you want more information about this. And it really tries to convey the information to the clinician, which may be helpful. Um, and we looked at these Gunn and Connor meta-analyses and basically plotted them out for you. And what you can see here is that one here, right, would be no difference. Over on this side, it says that there are adverse effects of marijuana use. And this side would say there's protective effects of marijuana use. And I think what's notable is that although many of these confidence intervals do cross one, um, they're all on the right side of the graph. So there's no study that sort of says, yeah, we think that it's good to use marijuana during pregnancy or decreases the risk of adverse outcome. They all are sort of on that side of increasing risk. And the birth weight one down here does show you that there's actually statistically significant difference in birth weight. And that has come up over and over in the existing literature. So if we go beyond perinatal outcomes and think about other outcomes, uh, specifically neurodevelopment, this is just a transition slide to transition to neurodevelopment. Um, and also because I got about 5,000 of copies of this when this came out in 2015, because I was researching uh, marijuana use and everybody knew about that. Um, but a lot of people are really worried about neurodevelopment, and I'm sure that you as ne neonatologists have thought about this as well. Um, we know that there are alterations in neurotransmitters in rat models, especially in dopaminergic pathways when we, use, um, when we expose them to marijuana in utero. Um, we know that postmortem human fetal brains, so looking at elective terminations between 17 and 22 weeks, they saw dopamine receptors reduced in marijuana exposed fetuses. This was most prominent in males, and it was directly correlated with the amount of marijuana used during pregnancy, which I think is the especially interesting part of that particular study. There have also been some human studies that have done prospective longitudinal follow-up. There's three of them, one out of Ottawa, one out of Pittsburgh, and then the Generation R study out of the Netherlands. And they really look at different groups and followed them longitudinally over time. So the OPPS is more low risk European American middle class. MHPCD, which is the Pittsburgh study, is really high risk mixed ethnicity, predominantly African American. And then the Generation R study is multi ethnic, um, much larger, and still ongoing. So, what's the problem with the data about neurodevelopment? I have to say up front that I think these data are really limited by confounding. And these investigators did an amazing job of trying to control for everything they possibly could. But there's just a lot that happens neurodevelopmentally from the time of birth until the time we're making these measurements that don't really have anything to do with that in utero marijuana exposure. And that's the hard part. So in the OPPS study, they found no difference between groups below age four. And at age four, there's increased behavior problems, worse language comprehension, decreased sustained attention and memory. And then in the MHPCD study, they saw decreased verbal reasoning at age six, worse academic performance at age 10, and increased substance use at age 14. In terms of neurodevelopment, um, uh, the Generation R study also has looked at this. So there's higher aggression scores in marijuana exposed girls, but not boys at 18 months. 
They didn't find any differences in behavior at three years of age, and they're continuing to follow um, these children into adulthood, and these children were born between 2002 and 2006, so hopefully there'll be more data coming out from that study. This is a recent study out of Nature Medicine in 2020. This was a retrospective cohort study of a birth registry in Ontario, Canada, looking at 2007 to 2012. They found a rate of cannabis use of 0.6%, so again, way too low, uh, definitely under ascertainment. Um, they found an incidence of autism spectrum disorder diagnosis of four per thousand person years with exposure compared to 2.4 among un unexposed with an adjusted hazard ratio of 1.51. They suggested very cautious interpretation for likely residual confounding. This is another study that came out in JAMA Psychiatry in 2020. It was a cross-sectional study of 12,000 children. It's the ABCD study, which you've probably seen come out, Adolescent Brain and Cognitive Development. 6% um, of these were exposed to cannabis prenatally with a mean age at follow-up of approximately 10 years. And cannabis exposure after maternal knowledge of pregnancy was associated with greater psychotic-like experiences and externalizing attention, thought, and social problems in the offspring. So how do we put all these findings together? The Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment put together a table after they did an initial comprehensive review of this topic. This was shortly after the time that it was legalized in Colorado, so like 2015, 2016. And basically, they found a lot of the things that we've talked about today. So moderate evidence of decreased growth, <clears throat> decreased IQ scores in young children, decreased cognitive function, decreased academic ability and attention problems, limited evidence for stillbirth. And I didn't really talk at all about SIDS um, or other depression symptoms or behaviors, but I did talk about isolated simple VSDs, insufficient evidence for some things, as well as mixed evidence for a lot of other things we talked about, preterm delivery, um, low birth weight specifically, um, and then birth defects that I didn't talk about, like NTDs and gastroschisis, because the data are just very mixed. The National Academy of Sciences, I told you, has put together a summary of cannabis use and the health effects, which I think is a very valuable document as well for people who are interested in this topic. There's a whole chapter on prenatal exposure. And basically what they ultimately concluded was there's a consistent association between prenatal cannabis use and lower birth weight in the offspring limited evidence of an association between cannabis use and NICU admission, and insufficient evidence of an association between cannabis use and neurocognitive outcomes. And they said this is just because it's really hard to adjust for those subtle environmental effects and uh, confounding factors that I talked about. So whether there was ongoing use in the home, how else that affected interactions between the parents and the children that could be associated with neurodevelopment, not just the exposure in utero itself. And so those are the tricky things. So what about breastfeeding? I think this is a hot topic in maternal fetal medicine, obviously also in neonatology. Um, THC does pass the neonate in the breast milk. Initially, this was based on data from a letter to the editor in the New England Journal of Medicine of two patients. I think that's what people did not realize when they were initially quoting this study over and over. Everybody said, oh, it's up to eight times in the plasma. That was in one person that that was measured in. And so fortunately, we have a little bit more data now. Not a lot, but we do have some more breastfeeding data. This was an observational study of eight women. So in this study, they purchased a product with known concentration of THC, and they actually purchased, were instructed to purchase it from a Colorado dispensary. They abstained from use for 24 hours prior, at least they were supposed to. And then they're supposed to inhale the cannabis, collect breast milk at 20 minutes, one, two, and four hours, and then send that breast milk to a lab so that they can measure it. And they um, found that exclusively breastfed infant ingests a mean of 2.5% of the maternal dose. So low transfer, but transfer. And, you know, obviously there's problems with this study, right? I mean, people were asked, why don't you go to a dispensary, buy some, buy some marijuana, get high, measure your, then try to measure your breast milk at very specific intervals. So, I mean, there are issues with this study, but it's certainly better than the one patient that the prior estimates were based on. So we're up to eight. There's also been another study here um, looking at 54 samples from milk donors. So they found Delta 9 THC, which is a metabolite detectable was in 63% of the samples up to six days after last reported use. So mo you know, the majority of patients who said they reported use, they could still find it up to six days out. The median concentration was 9.5 nanograms per ml, so not much. 
Um, and the number of daily uses and time from sample collection to analysis were predictors of concentration in breast milk. Not surprising, right? The more you use and how recent, how recent it was is going to impact how much is in the breast milk, but we know it does pass. We think it probably passes in small amounts. This is a, a study that I was part of in Colorado that was recently published in JAMA Peds. This is a prospective cohort study to estimate time to elimination of marijuana metabolite from breast milk. We enrolled 25 patients. Um, one of the inclusion criterion was plan for abstinence, but interestingly, um, only 12 of 25 remained abstinent because we sampled their plasma as well to see if they remained abstinent. And we found <clears throat> these patients said that they're primary, uh, primarily inhalation consumption during pregnancy. So it's not that people are using a bunch of edibles. Most people that are using are still inhaling. And I found that in a number of other studies as well. Um, and most were using more than two times weekly and that there's detectable THC in bre breast milk in all participants during the whole six week study period. So even among those who um, sustain, uh, abstained from use, they still had detectable THC for a, long, a prolonged period of time, which was something that we thought we might find because THC metabolites are very lipophilic or fat loving. Breast milk is very fatty. Um, and so it's not surprising that metabolites hang out in the breast. So this is just um, that data looking at 402 serial samples. So on these 25 patients got a whole bunch of samples over time. Um, the half-life was about 17 days for uh, marijuana use and the projected elimination was more than six weeks. So unfortunately this means that people can't pump and dump, right? We talk about this when we say, well, if you have this, this drug or this medication, just you know, pump and dump for 24 hours, meaning don't give the baby that breast milk. That's not going to be something that's um, feasible given the time to elimination for breast milk from, um, time to elimination for marijuana from the breast milk. Um, there are data looking at uh, neurodevelopment in babies who are exposed to marijuana via breast milk. Uh, unfortunately, it's really hard to sort out from in utero exposure. So those who were exposed um, it poor, scored poor, poorly on a psychomotor developmental index, but they said they really couldn't separate that from prenatal exposure. The American Academy of Pediatrics says that breastfeeding is contraindicated in women using illicit drugs, including marijuana. The American College of OBGYN says the same, same thing. Women should not use marijuana during pregnancy or lactate, while well, lactating, and that OBGYN should not prescribe for medicinal purposes to pregnant or lactating women. And there's insufficient evidence for the effects on the nursing infant. So how are we doing now? How are we doing in terms of counseling patients? We're not doing well. This is a study that recorded actual patient encounters and evaluated obstetric provider responses to the disclosure of marijuana use. 19% of patients reported marijuana use at their OB intake visits as their first prenatal visit. 47 different healthcare providers. So this isn't just like one person. And 48% of the time, the provider did not even respond to the marijuana disclosure. So patients disclosing use and the provider does not even respond to it. So that's a problem, right? We need to be talking to patients about this. Um, and when it was discussed, the response is really nonspecific and focused on talk screens and social services, which is also not helpful. We really need to be engaging patients in conversations about why they're using, what benefit they perceive, and can we offer them a safe alternative? I'm gonna skip these quotes just for time, but if you guys are interested in quotes from that study, they're very rich and it's very interesting. It's a Holland study in the Green Journal in 2016. Patients who use marijuana say similar things. So they looked at 33 pregnant or postpartum people, most reported daily use during pregnancy and most of them did not disclose use. So they had fear of uh, child protective services referrals. They had fear of being judged by the healthcare practitioner. And typically it just wasn't addressed by the provider. So uh, the patients didn't worry about telling them. So, and when it was addressed, it was mixed messages and legal threats, just like we saw in that other study. And so we're not doing a good job of this right now. If we don't talk to patients about this, somebody else is going to. This is a study where um, we did a mystery shopper study and we called 400 randomly selected dispensaries. Uh, the caller said that she was eight weeks pregnant with nausea. And what would they recommend? And 70% of them had product recommendations for that person. Um, they mostly recommended edibles. 65% based that recommendation on personal opinion, meaning they said something like, well, personally, or in my personal opinion, or in my opinion. Um, and only 32% recommended discussing it with a healthcare provider, um, which means that if we're not talking to them about it, somebody else is going to, and they're going to use these products. 
So how do we counsel patients? How do we get better at this? There's guidelines that are out there. So if you look at um, good to know, colorado.com is a nice website that has some patient information sheets with guidelines for providers that can help. They look like this. So even if you don't have time to talk to your patient, at least give them a handout about it, maybe trying to tackle some of the common misconceptions about marijuana use in pregnancy. Um, and just tell them that it's not what you'd recommend, and, but try to get to the bottom line of why they're using it. Maybe you can offer them something else. And so what do we tell patients on the obstetric side? We tell them there's no known benefits of marijuana use in pregnancy, that there's possible risks of marijuana use in pregnancy, and we advise patients not to use it during pregnancy. There's not any known safe amount of marijuana use during pregnancy. And where do we go from here? There's more research that's needed. Biologic sampling is critical. Um, hopefully I've convinced you of that by showing you the data and the differences in self-report and how that can impact our assessment of how it, how it affects outcomes. We need more data on timing and quantification of exposure, especially if we're looking at things like congenital anomalies. We need to know, was that exposure in the first trimester during embryogenesis? Additional areas of, of investigation are things like congenital malformations. There's that one Atlanta birth defects registry study, but it hasn't been validated. And that's definitely something that patients care about and wonder about is birth defects. Um, we really know very little about maternal morbidity associated with marijuana use. There are data on non-pregnant individuals demonstrating increased risks of hypertension. Um, and we don't really know what that does from a maternal morbidity perspective in pregnancy. And in terms of neonatal morbidity, there is more focus on NICU admission. It looks like there is a higher rate and a better understanding of why, because there's not a great described syndrome of withdrawal or anything like that. So it's unclear what's driving those NICU admission rates. I have been supported by a number of grants that have uh, provided the funding for a lot of the data that I presented to you all today. Um, initially, I was supported through a CCTSI, Child Maternal Health Junior Pilot Program grant from the University of Colorado. I was also a Women's Reproductive Health Research Scholar, which is a K-12 through the University of Colorado. Um, and now at University of Utah, I am um, running a, a NIDA, National Institute of Drug Abuse, uh, R01 project, really looking at uh, timing and quantity of exposure over time and adverse outcomes. So hopefully we'll have some better, more rigorous scientific answers for that stuff um, in the near future. There are a ton of references here. If any of you are interested in learning more about this, I'm also happy to speak with any of you at any time. And I just really wanna thank you for your time today. I very much appreciate the invitation and I'm happy to take questions if there's time for that.